Dear learners, welcome to the course MSD012 Ecosystem and Agile Resources of the program Postgraduate Diploma in Sustainability Science. You now, uh, in the last session, uh, we have talked about energy and uh, its different components and uh, what are all those in the energies, uh, different types of energy. Today, in this session, we will touch upon mineral resources. Uh, we know that uh, our life, you know, it is accompanied by mineral resources at every step and uh, use of uh, these minerals by human beings has been so extensive since the beginning of human civilization. And if you look into that, how we are more at ease to uh, uh, depend on uh, the particular uh, different mineral resources, you will find that in the history, in our history and the prehistory era, Sometimes uh, those era is uh, means named after minerals. For example, we have the Stone Age, we have Bronze Age, and Iron Age. Today uh, we ourselves attack at this uh, Iron Age, but if you look into the uh, resources we are using, you know we can say that we enter the age of silicon. You know because you know, if you look into the uh, that ICT, we are depending more dependent on that. ICT, computer, and so on. They are uh, and they uh, they are the, uh, and uh, entirely depend on all those semiconductors. And so, if we look into the electronics gadget, we are depending on this era. So, silicon is one of the important metal in the production of semi uh, semiconductors. So, we can assume that that uh, we can say that we are in the era of silicon, right? Then uh, when you talk about mineral, the question comes, what is mineral? And we know that mineral resources, they refer to material substances either composed of or extracted from the minerals, right? Now it includes, you know, ores, metals, gravel, sand, marble, granite, phosphate, rock, and so on that we have seen in front of us. Every I mean, it's, I mean, activities we they contain one or other form minerals, right? So these are actually, you know, all these minerals are actually in organic compounds, and uh, some of them, you know, we uh, we find that they are deposit, uh, their deposits, uh, they may be concentrated or accumulated by life form. For example, you know, limestone, and that is composed of uh, this limestone is composed of calcium carbonate cell of secretion. And the, as I told and everybody knows that uh, the, you will find, we find the minerals in large number of ways in every day uh, in our life, like in the, if you look into the domestic sector also from the morning to evening, we entirely use uh, most of our products are entirely based on mineral resources. You look into agricultural sector, you look into industrial sector, in the in commercial sectors also. So in that way, uh, minerals have become very essential you know, in development of industrial plant and machinery. Then when you talk about energy, generation of energy is also entirely depend on co uh, that uh, uh, minerals like coila, that lignite, uranium, then construction of housing, then road infrastructure, that's also depend on and an energy. If you look into defense sector, means that's also, you know, even armaments are made of uh, these uh, minerals. And even as we talk about uh, that uh, telephone, uh, that uh, communication era, then that's all. entirely depend on minerals like telephone wires, cable, electronic devices. If you look into health sector also, most of the Ayurvedic system, then they are particularly uh, that is uh, in depend on and also they contain uh, this uh, minerals component. So if you look into the alloys of various purpose like phosphoride, they also uh, then the contains of uh, uh, this a kind of minerals. So then if you look into agriculture sector like whatever we are depending on fertilizer, seed dressing, fungicide, all these contain minerals in the form of chemical or non-chemical, right? Like you know, most of one of the important is uh, with very precious is jewelry. You know, these gold, sil silver, platinum, diamonds, they are high graded minerals. So, uh, this mineral wealth is a natural asset, you know, that can stimulate or enhance economic growth potential and social progress. That is 
No, that is how sometimes we know in our uh, prehistory or history period we name it uh, that uh, that era in different form in uh, we tag the na names of minerals as that era, right? So if you look into the reserves of metals and the technical know-how to extract uh, these uh, uh, resources, uh, that is the uh, that uh, that have been that is the key elements in determining you know the economy and the political formation. At the same time, we know that the world is facing serious and long-term challenges in provision of these mineral energy sources. Although no global shortage of non fuel mineral sources are expected in the near future, if you look, but you know uh, there are a growing number and variety of obstacles. Uh, that is uh, that we have seen in front of us. So, uh, if you look into those issues, these are very complex issues that comprise of economic, technical, social, environment, and challenges. That's why, as a student of sustainable science, we need to, uh, I mean, understand, uh, aware about these mineral resources. So, today in this session, we are going to, uh, we are trying to understand in brief about. Uh, the increasing mineral demand and the scarcity of mineral, the pattern and causes of uh, mineral demand, you know, how when we talk about all these uh, causes, uh, impact of using of uh, these mineral resources, there is a need to understand how uh, mineral deposit ores and reserves, what kind of uh, I mean uh, extraction process we uh, follow in uh, extracting those mineral deposit ores and reserve uh, uh, for our uh, economic use and for our efficient use. So if you look into the increasing mineral, uh, that mineral demand is scarcity of mineral. Before coming to what uh, to know about the different types of minerals as a student of sustainability science, we need to understand why we need to study this. We know that before the 19th century, that global use of mineral was relatively insignificant compared to the abundance of mineral in geological deposits. Because when there is enough resources, we don't care about that. So if even, even if you go back to the industrial revolution, then suddenly uh, there is a, uh, uh, with, the, uh, the, with the associated phenomenon of demorphic means demorphic means demographic plus technological development and that highly enhanced rate of mineral resource usage. So in fact, what we can see, we can say is that after industrial revolution, suddenly uh, then, uh, uh, that rate of mineral resource usage increases. So it, in fact, if you look into uh, some of the evidence uh, from this fact is that the world's population has doubled. So when population is doubled, you know what happened? The mineral use has increased by a factor of 10. And especially with the evidence, if you look into the human history during 1750 to 1900, that uh, with the double increase in population, then by factor of 10, uh, that mineral use has been increased. So the mineral use at present means in, in this uh, during the decade is more than 13 times the amount use that used to be in 1900, right? So, uh, the demand for min mineral is, as we know, is still extremely high and uh, it will increase further with industrialization, especially in developing countries and developed countries. So, uh, on the other hand, we are replacing of aging infrastructure and uh, we are also trying to introduce new technologies looking into the issues of sustainability. So, this shows that the increase in demand will be increasing. So again, if you look into the life expect expectancy of a stock, if it is not linearly related to the increase in the stock, that is, for example, a 10 to 100 fold increase in the stock doesn't mean that the stock will last proportionally. So in, if you look that theoretically, uh, in a theoretical uh, situation, uh, let us assume that future exploitation will continue at present rate and demands remain the same. Then the life expectancy of a stock can be linearly related to the increase in the magnitude of this stock. In such situation, in such theoretical situation, the stock means the reserve is called static reserve. On the other hand, 
Uh, another kind of uh, that uh, that particular reserve we call is exponential reserve. When the demand generally increases exponentially, exponentially due to increase in population and per capita consumption and the life expectancy of the reserve decreases exponentially. Right. So when uh, but if you look into this exponential and uh, uh, this static reserve you know exponential is uh, more realistic as they better reflect the real world pattern of demand the demand for met metals such as you know tin zinc copper aluminum they grows at about one to four percent per year if you assume that demand is increased by 3.5 percent per year then annual demand will double approximately in every 20 years so a stock having a static reserve of 500 years may last only 83 years when exposing exponential rate of exploitation is taken into account. If we turn hypothetically 500 years static reserve is increased to 5000 years, the exponential reserve will increase from 83 years to only 147 years. So the bottom line is that on a global scale, the demand for mineral resources now are so great that even with a conservation of liberal estimate of remaining mineral stocks, the known supplies of a number of minerals will be exhausted within a few decades. So then what will the effect to the environment? The effect will be the environmental degradation and its associated you know, pollution of mining activities that force us to curtail the exploitation of mineral deposits before they are exhausted. So what we can do is we need to emphasize, emphasize the three R's we, as we know, reduce, reuse, recycle, as well as we need to find a substitute for mineral in short supply, right? So then this is a situation why we need to understand uh, uh, what are the minerals, how the extraction process is that, right? So uh, let us look into what are the mineral deposits, ores and reserves. Uh, we know that a mineral is a naturally occurring social uh, solid chemical substances that is formed through a geological process and it has a characteristic chemical composition highly ordered atomic uh, atomic structure and specific physical properties and we know that uh, this mineral range is uh, range in composition from you know pure elements and simple salts to very complex silicates with thousands of other forms like when we study about sustainability, we call that subject as sustainability science in the same way uh, uh, the study of minerals is called mineralogy. So, and uh, mineral deposits, you know, they are formed by natural geological processes, right? So, during the rock cycle, the weathering may dissolve or physically remove certain elements and the minerals that leaves behind a concentrated residue to the remaining minerals. So, then it follows sedimentary processes. The in sedimentary processes that can concentrate minerals to precipitation from a solution or by differential settling of grains in moving or in uh, still water, moving water or still water. At the same time, we know that certain minerals may selectively crystallize out of a hot molten body of you know, igneous rock. So during the formation of metamorphic rocks, elements may be mobilized in the rock resulting in mineral changes and sometimes it gives rise to economically useful mineral concentration. Uh, on the other hand, in certain elements, the high temperature associated with this igneous and the many metamorphic process that result into hydrothermal processes. That is a process when hot water dissolves, transport and subsequently re-precipitates re and concentrate elements minerals in deposit. So the abundance and distribution of minerals are very uneven as we know on a global scale you know only few elements like oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium that are extremely abundant making over uh, of about over 99% of the earth crust by weight. But in the same time some other elements like copper, tin etc are very rare. Again if you look into uh, most of the mineral deposit they are not usable and the supplies are practically exhaustible for abundant rare minerals okay so uh, when we talk we are trying to understand how it was extracted so then 
how we have to follow those processes. So a mineral deposit, it has become an ore deposit at certain point of time when the mining and the processing of the mineral becomes techno-economically feasible means, uh, means uh, that is a mineral deposit of today may become an ore deposit in some day. So when we identify but unexploited ore deposit are called as reserve. So one is ore deposit, another is reserve. So reserve estimates for a particular mineral that will increase as new ore deposit that come into existence. As the mining and the processing technology become more efficient and improved, or as price raises allows mining and processing of ore gas deposit happen. Right. So reserve estimates will decrease as non deposit of a particular mineral are exhausted or if market prices fall to decrease the mining of lower gas deposit so at current consumption rate as we know that iron and aluminum and earth curves could last a million years and 100 million years respectively if we do not follow any of the recycling process so it seems that but surely it is exhaustible but at the present rates of consumption Consumption, the proven ore deposit of iron and aluminum will last only for a few hundreds to a couple of thousand years, right? We know that many substances are very rare. For instance, copper has an average concentration of only 55 to 63 parts per million of the earth's crust and tin only 2 parts per million. There is an upper limit to the quantity of minerals that can be produced, even if energy supply is made unlimited. However, practically, if you look practically, our energy sources are limited. And taking into the world production, consumption and reserves into account, it has been estimated that our virgin supplies of ores for copper, tin, lead, zinc and various other metals will be exhausted in another century. So what are the types and grouping of those minerals? We know that mineral deposits are diverse in nature and composition and that reflect their origin. It can be divided into different categories such as metallic, non-metallic, and precious and energy material. When you talk about metallic minerals, you know, it includes uh, which are very common that are iron, aluminum, copper, zinc, lead, gold, tin, chromium and so on. So these metallic, uh, metallic minerals, they can be ferrous, means iron and related metals such as chromium, manganese, no, uh, ni uh, that nickel, molybdenum. They are uh, very common alloys with iron or non-ferrous like, you know, uh, gold, copper, silver, etc. In case of non-metallic minerals, uh, that can be similarly be divided into uh, that can be divided into structural materials and industrial material. When you talk about structural materials, uh, they are you know building stone. Uh, they are used for building stone, sand, and then uh, then we have uh, sand, gravel, and other component of cement and concrete. So when you talk about industrial material. Uh, it is, uh, for example, fertilizer component, phosphorus and potassium, salt, sulfur, uh, other metal used in manufacturing, asbestos, abrasive mineral, and so on. These are how non-metallic uh, that uh, minerals are uh, can be classified. Then coming into the third category is the precious minerals, uh, such, uh, such as you know gemstone and the semi-precious uh, minerals that serve no pragmatic function, function and are purely of ornamental and aesthetic values. Finally, another uh, that uh, category is energy minerals. That's of you know uranium and fossil fuels about like coal, oil, natural gas. Right? There are four category of energy minerals. So we know that uh, due to unequal distribution of mineral deposit around the world and depletion of once existing deposit, many countries have a small or non-existent reserve of certain important minerals. Such kind of certain minerals which are necessary for the production of essential goods, they are again further classified as critical minerals. Then another uh, classification we take into account is strategic minerals. When a critical mineral or a mineral is uh, called as a strategic mineral, that when a particular country or countries, they must import from areas that are potentially unstable, politically, military, so, uh, socially. So problem in these areas could disrupt the supplies of such minerals. So that's kind of mineral which is important in that particular country is called strategic mineral. So critical minerals may or may not always have substitutes and sometimes the substitutes are uh, rarer than the critical minerals some themselves. So in order to have a better understanding of the mineral deposit for 
effective exploration they are subdivided into different categories then the classification can be done based on a number of criteria right such as mineral or metal contents the shape or size of the deposit host rock means the rocks which enclose or contain deposit or the genesis of the deposit means geolo uh, that geological process which combined to form that deposit we know the uh, on the other hand based on the major anion group present in and uh, in approximate order of their abundance in the earth crust the uh, we follow the classification of uh, that minerals in different way one of the famous classification in dana uh, classification system is dana classification system in dana classification system uh, the minerals can be classified into nine uh, category one number one is silicate class carbonate class sulfate class halide class oxide class sulfide class uh, phosphate element and organic when we talk about silicate class the this is the largest group of minerals by far uh, then these are composed largely of silicon and oxygen with some parts of aluminum magnesium iron and calcium and if you look into most of the rocks they are 95% silicate right example of this category are feldspar quartz olivines pyroxenes amphiboles garnets and micas then second class second category is carbonate class uh, here in carbonate class the major anion is carbonate this includes minerals of calcium carbonate that's of calcite and aragonite magnesium calcium carbonate dolomite iron carbonate citrate right so carbonates are very commonly found in marine setting when carbonate containing dead organism settle and accumulate on the sea floor they are also found as evaporate deposit in some of the lakes like the great salt lake utah and also in karst region where the dissolution and the reprecipitation of carbonates leads to the formation of caves stalactites still uh, still and uh, stalagmites the carbonate class also includes the nitrate and borate minerals right then the uh, category 3 three, uh, three is sulfate class these sulfate class are anion of sulfate and are commonly formed in evaporating evaporitic setting but sulfates and halides are formed at the water sediment interface by slow evaporation of high saline waters they also occur in hydrothermal vein system as gangu gang minerals as gang minerals along with sulfide ore the secondary oxidation product of original sulfide minerals also come under this class common sulfide minerals are you know anhydrite calcium sulfate celestine strontium sulfate barite barium sulfate and gypsum hydrated calcium sulfate the sulfate class also include you know the commonly used chromate molybdate selenite sulfide tellurate and tungsten minerals the fourth category is halide class halides you know like sulfate they are commonly found in evaporite setting such as in you know, a salt lakes and landlocked uh, seas such as dead sea and great lakes uh, great salt lake it includes the fluoride chlorides bromide and iodide mineral this class mainly represent the natural salt such as uh, fluor fluoride calcium fluoride halide sodium chloride sulfide potassium chloride and sol ammonia means ammonium chloride the fifth category of uh, that mineral is oxide class this oxide class include the oxide and hydroxide mineral this class is extremely important is in addition to valuable metal they also provide the best record changes in the earth magnetic field they commonly occurs as precipitate close to the earth surface oxidation product of other minerals in the near surface weathering zone and is accessory uh, as accessory minerals in in the uh, igneous rocks of the crust and mantle example of common oxides are hematite iron oxide magnetite iron oxide uh, magnetite is also iron oxide chromite iron chromium oxide is final means magnesium aluminum oxide a common component mantle limonite iron titanium oxide uh, rutile titanium oxide and ice hydrogen oxide the sixth category of uh, minerals is sulfide class commonly you know this sulfide class include pyrite iron sulfide they are called as uh, sometimes called as fool's gold then chalcopyrite copper iron sulfide pental uh, petlandrite nickel iron sulfide and galena lead sulfide the sulfide class also includes the selenites the tellurites the arsenites and the 
antimonides, the, uh, bis uh, the bismutinides and uh, uh, that sulfur salts, right. The seventh category of uh, uh, this mineral class is phosphate class. It includes any minerals with tetrahedral unit uh, where you know uh, uh, this uh, that A, this in this formula you will see A of 4, this A can be phosphorus, antimony, arsenic and vanadium, right. By far the most commonly phosphate is apatite which is an important biological mineral found in teeth and the bones of many animals. The phosphate class include you know phosphate, arsenate, vinadate and uh, antimonate minerals. The eighth category of uh, uh, this uh, mineral class is element class. Now this element class is group covers native metals and intermetallic elements like you know gold, silver, copper, semi-metals and non-metals like antimony, bismuth, uh, graphite, sulfur, natural alloys such as you know electrum, a natural alloy of gold and silver, phosphite, silicide, nitrites and carbide. Now this carbide which are actually only found naturally in a few rare meteorites, right. The ninth class of uh, this uh, minerals is organic class. Uh, this includes you know biogenic substances getting concentrated or transformed by geological process. That is oxalates, melitates, then citrates, cyanates, acetates, formates, hydrocarbons, other miscellaneous species constitute this class. Example include you know uh, uh, mulite, melite, fictalite, carfetite, evenkite, and uh, abelsonite. Right. So uh, another category which uh, we commonly follow is you know uh, strands classification. And it's also very, uh, I mean, a scheme of division of this strength classification also more least, I mean, uh, same um, that of Duna classification. And uh, uh, this also depended on divided into uh, because of um, uh, dependent uh, that uh, basically based on the uh, families in group uh, according to chemical composition of that mineral and crystal, crystal structure of the, uh, that. Uh, minerals there are you know i will not go in detail about that if you look into that there are elements you know, if you look to the same uh, more or less same uh, to that of duna there are you know uh, elements sulfide and sulfoso allied oxide and hydroxide carbonates nitrate and borates sulfate chromates molybdate and tungstate phosphate arsenate vanadate silicates organic compound so uh, what this is uh, this so in this session you know what we learn is uh, on that we know that there are uh, the increase in mineral demand is scarcity of minerals and uh, with human civilization we depend on minerals this is evidence that few of uh, some of our uh, that's in our civilization before prehistory and the history it is found that our civilization was named after the mineral like uh, stone is then uh, you know uh, and so on so and uh, we also uh, learn about the different kind of mineral deposit ores in the reserve and uh, we uh, learn as a student of sustainable science uh, we need to learn about types and grouping of mineral resources which today we have discussed on all these things uh, i'm sure uh, with this basic knowledge on the, uh, this different kind of minerals, how we have to understand depending upon their characteristic, then uh, we will be able to uh, uh, understand what are the possible impact, how to utilize it efficiently in sustainable way. So thank you, thank you very much with this session. We can let us meet in the next session. Okay, thank you.